If your life feels like it's going the wrong way, perhaps it's time for some good spiritual direction. Tonight, we'll talk about what spiritual direction is and how we can benefit from it. So please stay with us. Thank you and welcome. I'm Father Mitch Packer and welcome to EWTN Live, our chance to bring you guests from all over the world. Our guest tonight is a friend of mine from one of my favorite places in the whole country, Sweet Home Chicago. And he's here tonight to share with us how we can get the most out of our spiritual lives through quality spiritual direction. From the Archdiocese of Chicago and St. James Parish in Salk Village, please welcome Father David Simonetti. Father David. Welcome back to the show. It's good Thank to you. have you with us. Thank you. Thank good you. to have you here. Uh, how are things back in Chicago? They're still there. We're yeah, doing they're still it. there. Yeah, the Lord hasn't returned yet. <laughs> no, so. the Lord hasn't returned. So, Very good. So the, the politics as usual yeah, and yeah. all the fun things that we're accustomed to. Yes, yes. Yeah, but we're yeah, doing yeah. good in the Archdiocese. Good, 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 good. Well, that's, that's for a given. Yeah. Now, um, one of the things that you want to talk about is spiritual direction. Yes. What gave you this interest in spiritual direction to begin with? Well, from my own experience as a seminarian, that's where I first uh, formally started a regular pattern of spiritual direction with, you know, the, you uh, have a spiritual director with the seminary and you'd meet regularly every two weeks, you know, throughout the five years of your uh, seminary training. And just the growth that they help you to see, develop in your relationship with God and, and the skill that the spiritual director had in walking with me in the spiritual life. One who was ahead of me, walking with me, reaching back his hand and guiding me into God's plan for my life. Someone who sort of knows where you're supposed to go and helps you to get there. Yeah, the Holy Spirit is the spiritual director and my spiritual director is a servant of the Holy Spirit. And that's what we do. And to help the person discover where God is leading them in their life. Right. Now, you've also been doing some studying about spiritual direction. Yeah. Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah. The past three years, I was with uh, a Jesuit program the, from the Institute for Priestly Formation out of uh, Creighton University. Now, um, that's the training and the discernment of spirits using the discernment of spirits of yours, uh, St. Ignatius of Loyola. Right. You know, those, those rules. And so we had a three-year program, which they actually held for priests at Mundelein Seminary. And three times a year for three years, I went. And you learn in the, and it's an art, the art of listening to the Holy Spirit in thoughts, feelings, and desires. And the people who ran the program, this, uh, Father Rich Kabuzda, Father John Horn, who is a Jesuit, right. uh, Deacon James Keating, who is just out of this world. He was my spiritual director for the course of that time. It was just invaluable to me, invaluable to me as a priest. And you know, it really, truly taught me how to pray, to receive and accept that I am God's son, his beloved son, and to accept that and receive it and pray in that love and in that spirit. And it, it's really, um, it's helping me continually, helping me grow in that relationship. All right. It was a tremendous program and uh, very necessary. All right, oh, that's good. So, so you had this program that, uh, well, first of all, you had the background of your own training mm -hmm. where spiritual direction was done with you. Mm -hmm. And then you've gone to this program to learn how to be a spiritual director. 
what would you say to our audience about uh, describing spiritual direction? What do you do? Like, like, for instance, is it the same thing as psychological counseling? Oh, no, no, it's not counseling. It's not, see, counseling is based on uh, the healing would take place with the skill of the counselor or the psychiatrist or whatever it might happen to be, his skill. And it's not the case with this. And it's certainly not pastoral counseling, which is important and necessary and it has its place. But that's not the place of spiritual direction. Spiritual direction is, the goal of spiritual direction is growing in my transforming union with God, growing in my relationship with God. I, I, I think that definition you know, needs to be unpacked a little bit. Growing in your transforming union with God. Yeah. What do you mean by transforming? Yeah. Well, let me use this language. Let me come at it this way. Very simple language. Growing in my relationship with God and growing into the image and likeness of God, you know, and deepening my relationship. And I guess that's very simple language. Deepening my relationship with the Lord by a spiritual director helps you to see in your deepest thoughts, feelings, and desires, God's movements in your soul, okay. you know. And when you are... They're not trying to solve a problem like in counseling or pastoral counseling. Right. They're trying to solve a problem, and that's necessary. Right. With spiritual direction, you're not solving a problem. You're walking on this journey in this relationship, and someone is helping you to see and reflect back where they hear the Holy Spirit moving in your soul and leading you to do His will. Now, in this regard, um, it, spiritual direction does not take the place of counseling. No, no. Counseling no. has its own role, right? Yeah, it's its own discipline. Right. right. And pastoral uh, counseling or um, whatever it might happen to be, everything has its own place. But spiritual direction is its own discipline, to, again, to help me deepen my relationship with God. Now, not that it may not take in some elements at times mm -hmm. of, of these things, but on its own, by definition, uh, it's walking with someone on this journey to help them in their growing relationship. Okay. Now, when we, we deal with this, you know, one of the questions that, uh, the, the number of questions that come up, uh, one of them is, how does somebody know they need spiritual direction? For instance, if their spiritual life is going well, and they're happy with their spiritual life. Do they still need spiritual direction, or can they just go off on their own? Yeah. Well, here's what said. I don't remember which saint said it, but it said, he who directs himself has a fool for a director, mm -hmm. you know? And so, you, you know, and, and you like that? So, <laughs> all the, yeah, all the yeah, Chicago yeah, wise yeah, guys yeah, like that. Yeah. I, t I told them on the bus, listen, we're on international TV. If I tell, even if you think it's a joke, laugh. Don't, <laughs> don't if you want to see bitter, you'll, the next three days you'll see bitter. Don't leave me hanging on TV. <laughs> the, the key here is that as we're walking this journey, Jesus said where two or three are gathered, I'd be there in their midst, right? right? And so it's very important not to direct yourself, because when we say, we can be very subjective, obviously. Things are going great. Oh, really? You know? And so, as someone's listening to you and hearing what you're saying, we don't hear what we're saying, really. When, when they hear it and then reflect it back, and we can hear what we're saying coming back to us. You know, somebody says, well, what I hear you saying, and did you relate that to God? A lot of things aren't in check. So, you, we really need, but, but you would, I guess I would ask, too, who would say, I think I need a spiritual director? Someone who's really serious about the spiritual life. Someone who's starting to be a priest or a religious absolutely has to have one. But someone by principle who is looking, like today in the gospel, at what is above, or you know, what we were talking about in the readings, that someone who is, really wants to grow in holiness, and again, in that union with God, 
and that requires someone to walk that journey because there are no lone rangers in the Christian life, you know, and that's a, a really basic principle. And you look at any of the saints, Saint Padre Pio, like my favorite saint. Saint Padre Pio had all the gifts and great super saint. Saint Padre Pio had a spiritual director because again, you need someone to help you along this path. Mm -hmm. So, so this is not only for a situation where you have a problem in your spiritual life. No, no, not at all. This is also for a situation where things are going well and you want to improve mm -hmm. uh, and get closer to God. Sure, because as you know, the spiritual life, right, has <laughs> hills and it has valleys and hills and valleys. And someone who is a spiritual director who understands the um, tradition of the saints, who understands the spiritual life and aspects of the soul and our great Catholic, you know, mysticism and things uh, can help as a physician, in a sense, spiritual physician, help someone see what's going on in their soul and, and help them understand what's going on. And for example, if they are um, experiencing great dryness and say, well, God isn't there when I'm praying. What's the sense of praying? Yeah, f describe spiritual dryness because sure. I, every so often on the radio I get questions about people who are experiencing dryness. They come to Mass mm -hmm. and Communion. They're faithful Catholics. They use uh, all the sacraments. They go to confession. But when they receive Communion, they don't feel any particular sense of peace. Yeah. What is spiritual dryness? Yeah. Well, spiritual dryness, again, you use the word. In spiritual direction, thoughts, feel, feelings, and desires are really important to pay attention to. And so you use the word feel. That's really important. F what did I feel? So in spiritual dryness, we'd say, I don't feel God's presence. Or, or let's say, I don't feel great uh, happiness or consolations in my prayer. It feels like a mouthful of dust when I'm praying, and I'm not feeling that. Now, again, according to the rules of discernment, that could be happening because somebody has a, an attachment to a sin that is disrupting their prayer. I mean, your conscience, the Holy Spirit could be disrupting your, your giving you a, a disrupted, uh, in a sense, soul because you are living two contradictory things and he could be tweaking your soul, disturbing it for the sake of bringing you to repentance. You know, it's, uh, I sometimes use the analogy of when I was teaching my baby brother to walk. You know, some, you know, there was a stage at which he could stand up, but he would hold on to my fingers and walk, you know, with me, and I'd show him how to walk. But then after he would do that for a little while, every so often I would pull my fingers back mm. and he would gasp and take a couple steps on his own and I'd grab him again. Yeah. You know, sometimes, God is not necessarily punishing a person yeah. with spiritual dryness. No. It can also be a, an example mm -hmm. of somebody needing to grow, yeah. not because there's anything wrong, but it's just time to grow. Yeah, and we all need to grow, and the Lord knows with each soul how best to do that. So he could be also, again, according to the rules of discernment, leaving somebody in their state to show them what they are on their own powers. You know, that spiritual transformation and growth is God's work right. and in his own time. Right. So it's not on me. I can't, again, get to it on my own. It's something I receive and something I cooperate with. And also, uh, for example, um, Mother Teresa, Blessed Mother Teresa of Calcutta, we have her relic here. Well, it is said she experienced tremendous spiritual dryness. No, but the Lord is always laboring to console us. The Lord is always laboring to console us. So although she may have felt on, on one level, there are different levels of your heart, you know, mm -hmm. on one level she may have felt dry, she still had the consolation in her heart that Jesus loves me though. You know, I am loving him even though I don't feel it. So she's loving him for the sake of loving him. Not because it feels good, but it's just and it's right to spend that time with him in prayer because he is God and I am his creature. I am his son. I am his daughter, you know. And so if the Lord leaves us in that state, 
uh, St. Ignatius would also say, if you feel in that state, you can also feel in some sense that it will pass, just like I said, hills and valleys, just as if you were in a state of, in a sense, desolation at times, you know, it will pass. And so you have to, the Lord is looking for consistency in your spiritual life, a dedication to him. In a sense, like uh, married people, if they stopped after the honeymoon phase, right, this is all great and lovey-dovey and all that, if they stop right there, look what happens. But there are good times and there are bad times, hills and valleys. Right. And so spiritual director, from the knowledge of the saints and our tradition, and again, and our theology and all of these understandings of the spiritual life and the spiritual masters, we try to help those persons through those times in their life. See, that's, that's one of the things that's very important for spiritual directors to do, is read about the lives of great saints mm -hmm. who were good at discernment of God's will. Yeah. Uh, Ignatius Loyola is one, great. but Teresa of Avila, John of the Cross are others, and, many, and there are many others besides them. Yeah. John of the Cross, if you look in the Catechism of the Catholic Church, uh, under the, the third section on prayer, the life of prayer, which everybody, every Christian should read that section and truly read it and keep going back to it. But there's a quote from John of the Cross about the importance of spiritual direction and the spiritual director's competence. And, and if I can paraphrase it in a sense, he said a person should be very, very careful whose hands the heat they put their soul into because an incompetent spiritual director or you know, one who's not faithful, he says, so the master, so the disciple. And an incompetent spiritual director or one who is not humble or not prayerful or disobedient to the church and doesn't believe what the church believes and who's just maybe you know, thinking uh, on some other lines that are not the Orthodox Catholic lines, can if drive somebody off the cliff, you know, run off the cliff, uh, take someone with him. Blind guides. Right. Jesus said blind guides. Right. So somebody has to be truly humble, very prayerful. I remember when um, we talked about Mother Angelica, you said Mother could move with the inspirations of the Holy Spirit because she prayed four hours a day. She, her soul was so sensitive to the Holy Spirit, right. you know, and she could, under, she could understand what was going on. So a spiritual director has to be a true, true person of deep prayer. And the person coming for direction has got to have a deep, deep prayer life that the spiritual director helps deepen with the gifts and riches and treasures of the church. And one of the things about the prayer life of the directee is that sometimes it's possible for the directee to be saying so many prayers, mm -hmm. following so many devotions, which I'm not against. I yeah. mean, our devotions and formula, formula prayers are very important. They teach yeah. us how to pray, and those are great gifts. But some people spend so much of their time going from one devotion to another yeah. that they never listen to what God is trying to tell them, and then yeah. it becomes difficult to do spiritual direction. Yeah. Yeah, as a matter of fact, that's why when a spiritual director is asking the person, what does your prayer life look like? Your faith has to look like something. And when you, if you detect that, you can tell when you're asking them to reflect on what you're, since the last time you've met, you can tell uh, where their sort of soul is if you're really listening because a person who is not disposed to silent listening to the Lord you know, and it was just rattling. Some, the Lord can't do much with a talkative soul. You know, to talk, 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 talk. you know yeah. what I'm saying? And so a person, has, it's a dialogue with the Lord. And if you're just rattling off one thing after another and you're not, okay, now let me talk. The Lord's saying, okay, be quiet. Okay, right. Be quiet, I'm, I'm trying to talk to you. Well, think about you it. Know? How many times do we like it when somebody that we're talking to does all the talking? Yeah. Yeah. And we don't get to do a back and forth. Mm -hmm. I mean, that can be an uncomfortable situation. Yeah. For the Lord, it's the same thing. Mm -hmm. You know, that he wants us 
to listen to him too. Yeah, I had one fellow come to me. It, it didn't work out well. I mean, a spiritual director, first you test it for a, a trial period. But if somebody is coming to you and, and you're trying to help them grow in this relationship, but it appears they're j just not, at this point at least, open into listening to the Lord. I remember a guy would sit with me and I'd say, okay, well, you know, how's your prayer life going? Oh, yeah, fine, good. Uh -huh. Yeah. And I said, well, did you hear the Lord say, say anything to you? No, 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 no. I said, oh, great. He only. said no? No, no, no. Didn't hear anything, no. Then and what, there was so, what was going so well? I, you know what? I, 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 yeah, and I, I remember thinking in my head, oh, great, only 58 more minutes, you know? <laughs> and, and he just wasn't coming to spiritual direction with prayer behind him or listening. And so I was trying to, you try to guide a directee in, for example, example, uh, Lexio Divina. What's that? S Lexio Divina or sacred reading. And Pope Benedict XVI has been outstanding in recon recommending this. This is um, contemplative prayer. Contemplative prayer, you take the Holy Scriptures, the living word of God. As Mother Angelica on this very stage talked about every week, the living word of God, it's living. It's not the sports page. It's not just news that once it's read, it's over and it has no transforming effect. It's the living word of God. It, the Lord has something to say to you in his living word right now, today, in your circumstances. And so you take the word of God and there are different steps. It was really developed by the monks and it's, you know, worldwide. Yeah, especially Benedictine monks. Benedictine monks in particular. And so it's a way of reading the script, praying. I don't want to use the word reading. Praying, just a small paragraph. You don't pray through a chapter, a small paragraph, particularly, for example, the Gospels, and to pray it a few times and notice if a word, an image, a thought particularly jumps out at you. And then to take that and ruminate on it and pray and reflect on that image, thought, why is that coming up? What is the Lord trying to say that, to me in this? And then relating it to the Lord. Lord, what are you trying to say to me? Asking him. And then after that, remember, dialogue. Prayer is dialogue. Silent. And sitting in the contemplation part of it. You, first you meditate on it, on the word of God. And then you take it in, you relate it to the Lord. And then you contemplate it. Say, Lord, now let him speak to me. And see, just see where the Holy Spirit is leading you to where he, what he is saying to you in this scripture. Or you put yourself, Ignatius was good for this, put yourself in that scene in the gospel. Yeah, St. Ignatius described mm -hmm. how you use your imagination yeah. to imagine that you hear the words of Jesus. What would his voice sound yeah. like? You see the scene, mm -hmm. you smell the smells. If you mm -hmm. had to see a Galilee and there's multiplication of loaves and fish you, mm -hmm. and so on, and, and you, you enter into the scene, mm -hmm. you that's might, a very important way to pray. You might put yourself in the place of Peter when right. he looks at you or he, when it says, and he turned and looked at Peter. You know what I mean? And that, just that phrase, and if you put yourself in Peter's spot and say, you know, am I feeling afraid when he looked at me? Why am I afraid? You know, um, what is my relationship with him? Those things, the Holy Spirit speaks to us through that living word. Right. And so it's really important. And that develops, that's, Pope Benedict is very clear. That's where we get to know Jesus, in the scriptures, in a very, very special way. See, and there are a lot of people who so much want to hear from God. Mm -hmm that they will go to a lot of locutionaries and visionaries and other folks like that instead of simply listening to Jesus speak in the Gospels. Yeah, yeah. And, and as a spiritual director, too, when you start to, again, form this bond with this directee and start to understand him, because it is a relationship that grows. And actually, it's a relationship that is really a, more of a long-term relationship. But as you start to hear them uh, and hear what they seem to be hearing, 
and you help them develop their prayer life, you can recommend to them. See, it's, it's real important that the spiritual director, our job is not to put my thing on you. Right. It's right. not to put my, I know what you need. No, no, no. My, the way the Lord is dealing with me and at this point in my life is not necessarily for you. So I don't put that on you. However, however, I can, with tried and true devotions in our Catholic faith, I can say in contemplative prayer to really hear the Lord in contemplation, it is safe to say, go to Eucharistic adoration. Pick up the holy, eternal, living word of God before the blessed sacrament and talk to Jesus from your heart and then listen to him right. and divide. and listen it's so important you know I, I was telling you earlier I bought your book um, how to listen how, how to, to listen. God when God how to listen when God is speaking yeah how to listen when God is speaking and I mean I read it in two days and it's something that I want to keep going back to because it's something people are especially with all the noise and the sound bites and this phone and iPad and Twitter, bitter, batter, beater, and all these <laughs> toys. My point is, people's minds, <laughs> people's minds are are so wound up that they don't know how to settle down. I know. And listen, there's a lot of noise. As a matter of fact, uh, there's a book uh, called Noise uh, out there about the noisiness of our culture, and and it's a a good book to, to help us to learn to become quiet and listen to God. You know, I want to, uh, we have to take a break in just a minute or so, but I want to let people know for, if you want more information on spiritual direction, our EW10 Religious Catalog has three great books on the subject. One is by our good friend, the late Father Thomas DeBay, entitled Seeking Spiritual Direction. Another one of his books is The Fire Within. So those are two great books by Father DeBay. And then, as Father just mentioned, I have a new book, How to Listen When God is Speaking. You can get these books by going to www.ewtnreligiouscatalog.com. Or if you don't want to go on the Internet, you can call 1-800-854-6316. That's 1-800-854-6316. And before we go to a break, I want to remind you that if you want to stay up to date on the latest news from Faithful Catholic Perspective, subscribe to the National Catholic Register by going to www.ewtn.com and click on the National Register link over there. All right, we're going to take a little break. Uh, we'll come back in just a couple of minutes. And we'll, we'll take questions from our studio audience as well as your questions. So please stay with us. We have a really nice group. Father Simonetti uh, not only has come here to be on our program, but he brought his own audience. <laughs> See, this is how we do things in Chicago. It's yeah. no wonder we know who's going to win the elections. Yeah. You know, that's I, the way that it goes. I don't throw darts at a board. No, like no, a sure no. Thing. So uh, if you can join us, uh, 
for a pilgrimage, you can bring a group from your parish like Father did, or you can come on your own or come with your family. Any way of those, you're very welcome. And you can contact our pilgrimage department at 205-271-2966. That's 205-271-2966. Or go to our website, www.ewtn.com. And they'll give you all sorts of information about places you can stay, scheduling of programs, masses, the tours of the studios. Did you go on the tour today with your group? Yes. How, how was the tour? Good. Good. That's good. We love, we love having you come and join us. So please be part of our, our, our studio audience right here in Birmingham, Alabama. Uh, you ready for some questions? Yes, yes. All uh, right, let's start off with this gentleman here. Sir, where are you from? From Dallas, Father. Dallas, Texas. Love the Ace Wings, by the way. Uh, as a matter of fact, you gave them to All me. All right, I love them. <laughs> this is the gentleman who uh, is in charge of the pro-life committee for the Knights of Columbus in uh, Texas, correct? The state of Texas, All right. Right. I just and, made my fourth degree. Oh, awesome. Good. There you Great. Go. Congratulations and welcome. And, and so uh, when I was down in Texas, they got me these wings. A lot of people ask me, what are those wings you wear? And it's a pro-life award called the ACE Award for being pro-life without accommodation, compromise, or exception. Right. So they, they came up with that in Texas. Well, Father, my question is, um, I'm fortunate to have a spiritual director, but when I was uh, contemplating having one or going to seek one, I was worried about priests being way too busy uh, for, for, for myself or for anybody. Uh, is that something we should be concerned with? Yeah. He asked, it's true, the priests, especially these days, at least, you know, in Chicago, a lot of, at least where, where I live, for the most part, it's one priest per parish, right. and you are busy, you know. Right. And so, but first I would advise a person to ask the Holy Spirit to direct me to someone, and, and you know what, you don't have to wait for the sky to flash with a sign, go with what's right in front of your nose. You can go to your pastor, and ask him. And if he and generally the priests know what they can do, what they can't do, and will be honest with you. And I mean sometimes people ask me and I say, at this point in time with the number of directees I have already, my parish responsibilities, you know, I will let them know honestly if I can or if I can't. And I may also know who I would trust as a faithful priest, who I would trust to recommend to them. Sure. Yeah. Sure. Oh, I have a caller, Pat. Hello? Yes. Hi, Pat. Where are you from? Uh, Portland, Oregon. Great. That's a beautiful city. And what is your question? Uh, my question kind of leads into that. First question is, can I expect my parish to provide a spiritual director, or do I have to look elsewhere? Well, um, it sort of piggybacks on the last question. I would start first with your own pastor, right? Or uh, maybe the deacon. I mean, again, work it out. Go to the pastor first and just see. And maybe they can direct you to someone if they themselves cannot do it or may know some retired priests in the area. Right, Yeah. right. And one of the other things, for instance, in the Portland area, uh, there is a Benedictine monastery at Mount Angel. And you may find out or, or ask if one of the monks or one of the sisters at the convent, because uh, there's also a Benedictine convent, if one of them would be able to, to have, give you spiritual director, direction. Uh, a lot of places have monasteries where some of the monks might be willing to do spiritual direction. And that's another place to look uh, besides your parish. Sure, if you have one of those in the area, sure. Sure. Ma'am, where are you from? Uh, Waukegan, Illinois. Waukegan, yeah. I know it well. And Great. what's your question? That's uh, the home of Jack Benny. Yes, it is. And right. what's your question? Well, it's uh, pretty much the same. How or where does one find a spiritual director? Uh, All right. You know, yeah. in the Chicago area, how about that? Yeah, well, there's a parish on every corner. But uh, yeah, it's a matter of do you want an Italian, do you want a German, do you want an Irish? You know, that's how they work. But again, first of all, the Holy Spirit is the director. And ask him, 
Holy Spirit, I really feel being called, I'm being called to enter into spiritual direction. Could you guide me? Give me the light. Oh, everything must always be asked in prayer, everything. Can you give me the light? Direct me. Direct my steps and go with what's right in front of your nose. As you say, maybe the person, you know, again, one you have a relationship with and you trust and who knows you will probably give you the best, who cares about you, probably give you, take the time to give you the best advice. If he himself cannot do it, maybe say, hey, I know of a monastery here or if I know of a retired priest over there, mm -hmm. things like that. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, we have a, a caller. Uh, Joan, are you there? Hello, Joan. Hello. Hi, Joan. Where are you from? I'm. Hi, Joan. Where are you from? I. I. You turn off Marion. your television. Am I on? Yes, you are. I. I'm from Marion, Iowa. Okay. My question is. Uh, could I possibly get a spiritual director from a good Catholic layperson? I don't mean uh, Catholic charities or anything like that. I mean just a, a good Catholic friend because I am uh, 84 years old. Today is my birthday. I'm able, birthday. unable to attend Mass or go to uh, adoration of the Blessed Sacrament. I do receive communion once in a while, but uh, the best place I get my spiritual direction are the homilies on EWT and morning Mass. Especially this morning? <laughs> <laughs> Always a wise guy. <laughs> I know. I know. What are you going to do? So, so your question is, can you ask a lay person to be your spiritual director, a, a friend of yours, to help you with that? What sure. do you think? You know, here's, here's my caution. A spiritual director, remember the quote from St. John of the Cross. You don't want someone who is just going to give you nice human advice, you know, and say, just like, you know, sitting over coffee, kick around a few ideas. A spiritual director, this is, you wouldn't go to a, a, a friend who read a book on biology and said, you know, hey, I, you know, I've got a pain in here. You read a book on biology and you're a nice person. You know, can you, can you treat me? A spiritual director really does you, have You want to go to a doctor. You want to go to a doctor. Not to I mean, someone who read a little yeah, bit of biology right, one time. That's right. And so a, a spiritual director should be trained, trained in theology know what the church teaches in her doctrines, believe it, adhere to it, willingly, not begrudgingly, and um, have a deep, deep prayer life, but know something about mystical theology, know something about the discernment of spirits. And so you're not giving my own opinion, I'm not giving my own opinion. I'm giving you the treasure of the saints in the church and the rich apostolic tradition and our understanding uh, from, again, Teresa of Avila, John of the Cross, to see what appears on the outside. Well, for example, that's why Mother Teresa was so misunderstood in the secular papers. It says, oh, she didn't believe in God, see there? No, they don't know a thing about the spiritual life. You don't ask them, they're, out, they're outside of their competence, their field. And so it's, it's really important to have someone competent to be directing your soul. Right. So I'd be really cautious unless they met those criteria. Right, 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 and you know, uh, uh, what about this situation? If you have a friend, like because this lady is homebound, mm -hmm. she can't go to the local yeah, parish sure. or monastery to get spiritual direction. Um, could a friend at least be a sounding board? Absolutely, and we need, remember, again, I've said earlier, there are no lone rangers in the Christian life. We are a body. We need each other. I am a Christian in relate. I am a person in relation to another. And so we need those rich spiritual friendship, good and holy friendships. Right. But now talking about pure spiritual direction to see what's going on in the soul, again, um, that you have to really discern out and be careful with. Right. We have another question from our studio audience. Ma'am, where are you from? I am from Sussex, Wisconsin. And what's your question? Uh, knowing the difference between a spiritual director and a spiritual counselor, is there ever a time a director would refer you 
for counseling and since I had education in that field, would I offer my services in connection with a director? Yeah. That's a really excellent question. Yes, it is. Before I was ordained, there's a, a priest I really respect, Father Chuck Faso. he's a Franciscan. Oh, and yes. he vested me when I was ordained. And he's from my home parish in St. Agnes in Chicago Heights. And Father Chuck Faso said to me, I'll never forget it, he said, I want to give you some advice. A priest has to know when he's out of his field. He has to know when it's out of his competence. I am not a psychiatrist. Unless, I mean, Father Benedict Rochelle is a psychologist, but, but I am not a psychologist, a psychiatrist. I am not a doctor. I am right. not, a, a, for example, a, a particular kind of therapist, and I know that. So yeah, I can't treat a case of depression right. uh, with spiritual direction. Right. Now, I may be able, in my particular area, in the area of hope in Christ Jesus and certain things, to aid that. But I have to know, and this takes, that's the key about, remember I saying about being humble? That, you know, it's not, I know what you need and I've got a, a tech, you know, the, the shell answer man or whatever. It's very simple. I have to know when I'm out of my league, out of my depths, out of my area of competence and refer them. And priests usually have a, what would you call it, a list of a certain kind of aids helps to say, okay, I have to refer you to this person who I believe can help you. Because to be integrated, to integrate all those gifts and sciences and things together. Right, right. But so this is my the, aspect. This is my part that I'm helping you with. Right, and I can deal with this, the, the uh, spiritual direction. But if your marriage is having a problem, then I need to refer you to a marriage counselor. Yeah. yeah. And they'll take care of that. And they're not doing spiritual direction. No. They're dealing with marriage, you know, relational counseling. Mm -hmm. and, and that's a very important thing to do. Yeah. And, you know, like this lady could, you know, give her name to her local pastor to say, look, if you need, you know, somebody who needs this kind, the kind of counseling I know how to do, mm -hmm. this is what my degree is in and so on, and I've got the, that background. Mm -hmm. That would be very legitimate. Sure. And I can work in conjunction with right. their counsel. I mean, I, you know, can work, come in it that way. But... Again, specifically speaking, when someone comes to spiritual direction, it's for a specific area of their life. Again, growing in their relationship with God. What is God saying to them in their deepest thoughts, feelings, desires, and movements, effective movements in their soul? Okay. We have another caller on the line. Hello, Rose. Uh, good evening, Father. Hi, where are you from? I'm from New York. Great, and what's your question? Uh, I would like to know how you feel about doing the divine office every day, in addition to going to Mass and receiving and doing other spiritual readings. What is your opinion on the divine office on a daily basis? Sure, well, the Church recommends it for everyone. Now, Father and I, uh, bishops, priests, deacons, we are obliged to say it because it is a liturgy. The liturgy, and it's not my own personal prayer. It's I am praying the liturgy for the church, the sanctification of the time. But everyone is invited to the divine office. And so that's a good and rich thing to, again, hear the word of God, to pray the word of God and praise and thanksgiving and the, the lament, lament psalms and things like that. So that's a wonderful thing. Yeah, yeah, the... the uh the Liturgy of the Hours is the official mm -hmm. prayer book of the church. Yeah, yeah. No other uh, prayer book is the official one mm -hmm. except the divine office. Yeah. And, you know, no matter what rite you belong to, there's a Liturgy of the Hours for each of the rites. Yeah. And this is something that any person at all can pray. And it's a great way for husbands and wives to pray together. Mm -hmm. You know, that they can pray the offices depending on how many kids are still at home sure, and all, sure. how much time they have. Yeah. Uh, but they can, everybody can pray that. Yeah, definitely. I would definitely recommend it in a prayer life. Yep, yep, yep. As a matter of fact, it's not even a bad idea uh, to ask the pastor if maybe you and some other people could pray the Liturgy of the Hours, say, before the morning Mass. Mm -hmm. You know, take 15 minutes or whatever you need to go through that.
Mm -hmm. uh, that's a great way to prepare for going to Mass. Definitely, to hear the Word of God. Yep. All right, we have another question from our studio audience. Ma'am, where are you from? Crown Point, Indiana. Great, good to have you here. And what's your question? If I would go to a spiritual director, what kind of questions would I expect him or her to ask me? Oh, that's a great question. Yeah. A spiritual director, again, the primary relationship, the primary relationship is between the directee and God. I am a servant of that. So I would ask the person, first of all, and there's, it's a relationship, so it's kind of like as that relationship grows, the questions and direction changes as I get more information, in a sense. So I would start off asking the person, tell me about your prayer life. Right. Because prayer is the key here, to find out where are they praying, but how are they praying, and in there, again, I, I keep going back to this, it's so important, in their deepest thoughts, feelings, desires, are they, they may say things to me with their feeling, and I will say to them, but are you, you told me that, but are you telling the Lord that? Did you tell the Lord what you just told me? And many times they have not. Right. Well, let's relate that to the Lord. So I would ask them those things, and what's going on in their life? Where are they at this point? And then I would ask them, what are you looking for? Remember right. Jesus, when he turned to the two who would be his disciples, what are you looking for? Right. I would ask them, what are you looking for? What is within you? What is the Lord doing within you that you are reaching out for, you know, to know where we're going here? And one of the other things that's very key to ask is what is the Lord saying to you in your prayer time? Mm -hmm. what's, what's happening in, in that prayer time so that, you know, paying close attention mm -hmm. to what's happening in the prayer life, that's the key to this. Yeah, no, absolutely. Because again, in this union with the Lord, the Lord does speak to people and they just sometimes don't know how to listen. And we're trying to train them. Cardinal George once uh, said to us, said to me, people have to be trained how to be holy. That's your job. You have to help them, you know. And so it's very important to help them, to give them the tools to start listening. And so again, uh, things I invented, no. The living word of God, the rosary, a beautiful, meditative, contemplative prayer, you know, and to enter into the mystery of God. That's what we're doing. We're growing, entering into, we're kneeling before the great mystery. So to help people with that. Right, right. We have another caller on the line. Hello, Mike. Hey, how you two doing? Fine, thanks. Enjoying Where are you show? from? Um, I had a question, and I was wondering, is it advisable to go to the Sacrament of uh, Reconciliation after your spiritual director? I imagine always uh, to be a priest. I'm not sure about that anyway. Or, or not at all to this person. And um, if, if they do go to confession, and I've always been taught that when you go to confession um, to a priest, they're kind of taught, I thought, to uh, you know, not remember the sins and that they're forgiven and they're not to bring up anything that they've heard in the confessional. So I just wanted your comments on that, you know, the difference between maybe going to the Sacrament of Reconciliation and going to a spiritual director. That's a very good question, that's Mike. A that, Michael, that's a great question. Well, spiritual direction is not confession in, on its own in this sense. You and I have a seal put on the confessional. We cannot repeat anything, no matter what. We cannot repeat it. It stays there. That, there is no seal on spiritual direction. Now there is a professionalism there. There is a confidentiality there, unless the person's clearly going to hurt themselves or others. But there isn't the strict seal, like there is that. Now, I do recommend that people go to confession uh, to their spiritual director. Sometimes people have spiritual direction within the context of confession. And that's something you and the directee you know, have to work out but I would highly recommend they go to confession uh, to him. See, the, the one difficulty that he brings up is, is the seal because after having heard something in confession, we are not even allowed to bring it up to no, the person no. who did the confession. Yeah. And so there, there is a, a certain block that we may know something mm -hmm. from the, the confessional 
that we then cannot talk about unless the directee brings it up. Mm -hmm. Whereas when we hear things in spiritual direction, we can go back to it mm -hmm. yeah. and, and ask them about it. And that, so that's one thing about that's yeah. a negative to go into confession to your spiritual director. Yeah, well, and if you keep those things separate, and it's right. very clear that they're separate. Right, right, right. Now that's very important. You know, one of the things that we were talking about in, during the break is how important, you know, it is for the vocation crisis mm -hmm. to have people who are listening to God speak to them in prayer. Yeah. Talk to us a little bit about yeah. that. You know, when, when people are going to make decisions, you have to bring it to the Lord in prayer and say, well, Lord, I would like to do this. What do you think? Do you want me to do this? See, the Lord wants you to be have an abundant life here and right. in eternity. And what His will is for you will make you the most content and fulfilled here and in eternal life. So, and sometimes you're choosing between two goods. Maybe, Lord, I think you're calling me the priesthood, but I'd rather, for example, be married or whatever, and two goods. But one of those will make you the most happy and content. So you have to bring that to the Lord in honesty. And in spiritual direction, a director, a skilled director will help you to discern where your deepest desires are, where you can see the Lord pulling you the most in that attraction. Now, with again, going back to all of the noise, when people are so, it's a deafening, deafening roar of noise and people are not hearing the Lord, they're not settling down long, they're moving so quick, they're not settling down long enough to pick up the Word of God and settle down. To even, you know, oh, to even get into prayer, you can't just rush. That's a problem with people sometimes going to Mass. They just rush into Mass and then, you know, even get there late and say, well, I didn't get anything out of it. Or they rush into the Adoration Chapel and, you know, say a few things quick and then run out or, or say, well, I took time to pray at night and they rushed into it. You have to, in a sense, even prepare to pray by, because we're, we're moving so fast, to settle down, relax, breathe, Dispo pray to the Holy Spirit to dispose us to prayer. And that's the beautiful thing of the rosary. And then you enter into that prayer so then I can settle down and start to hear the Lord speaking to me. And it, when they don't do that, how many vocations are not coming to fruition because people will not slow down long enough to hear the Lord. And so, and there are a lot of voices out there and they're not all from heaven. Yeah, they're right. not all from heaven. There are a lot of competing voices and the Lord kind of whispers. He's not going to compete. He whispers and he wants us to hear him, but we have to be faithful to our prayer to give the Lord the opportunity to speak to us. So that's another thing. Perseverance in prayer, despite how it feels, to give the Lord the opportunity to speak to us. You know, one of the things that um, a priest friend of mine has pointed out is that there's a correspondence between the number of Eucharistic adoration chapels and vocations mm -hmm. so that people go to the Eucharistic adoration chapel where there are not other disturbances and they can listen to God and hear their vocation to be married yeah. because there's a crisis in the vocation to marriage. Yeah or to the vocation to the priesthood or to the religious life. Mm -hmm. You know, and all, all of this is a very important thing to listen to that. The, the book I was talking about, Noise, is by Teresa Tamio. Uh, I think you can get it from Religious Catalog here. Uh, it's a, a, a good way to remind us of how important it is to learn to listen. Yeah, and to rest in the Lord. I built an adoration chapel at my parish the Pope John Paul the Great Chapel of Eucharistic Adoration and in it, it came to me in prayer. It was really so peaceful and consoling every time I thought of it that I put it on the outside of the chapel from the great psalm, besides restful waters, he leads me. And people need to, I'm not talking about physical rest, but to rest in the Lord. Right. To it's truly, a spiritual it's rest. It's a spiritual rest to lay at his breast and to truly rest in him. And if people 
will make time for the Lord. Then they could start to hear him. And a director, a good director, will help you, guide you to that. Right. I'm afraid we've run out of time. No. Thank you for helping no. us with this very important topic. Sure. And on this holy card of Blessed Mother Teresa, we have a relic of her hair and her sari. Uh, may Almighty God bless you, and by the intercession of Blessed Teresa, aid you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. And, you know, we can bring you Father Simonetti and all the other guests who come here to EWTN to do this program and all the other programs because this network is brought to you by you. And right now we are still down a bit, uh, quite a bit, actually, uh, in, in our donations, and we need your support. So please keep us in between your gas bill, your electric bill, and your cable bill, and we'll be able to pay our bills. God bless you and thank you.